Right then, fellas, another sponsor for the pod is probably something you're very familiar with if you're in the e-commerce space. It's certainly something I am. It's Wayflyer. Cash flow is the biggest killer of any fast-growing e-com brand, as I probably more than most know very fucking well. Go and watch episode one if you haven't already. Wayflyer is an e-commerce funding partner. Essentially, they can front you the cash for a month or so worth of sales. You need a minimum of six months sales, a minimum of 20 grand a month, I believe, right now. If you've got a brand that you're super, super passionate about, you want to scale it quick, but cash is a problem, to invest in inventory, mainly marketing, overheads, team costs, whatever it is, you can get funded in as little as two to three days. It's literally that quick. No bullshit bank loans, no personal guarantees. I've worked with them personally in the past, took a six figure sum off them. Plenty of guys I know in my network and people that have been on the pod and run massively successful brands have also used them as a funding partner because everyone knows at scale, cash flow is the biggest killer, even if you are profitable. If you think this could be a fit, potentially you could be a fit for them, then go click the link below. Speak to the guys at Wayflyer. It's a referral link, so we get a little fee, you save a little bit as well. Support the pod, support your business. Cash is king, especially in this market. Let's fucking go. Right, we're back with episode 76 of the Midnight Pod. We have Lawrence Booth Clibben. Have I said that correctly? Smashed it. And it's the hottest fucking pod we've ever filmed. I think it's (laughs) probably actually (laughs) the salt and barley, 33 degrees. My aircon does not work. I'm teetotal, so I'm missing an ice cold GNT or something similar. But we're back at the table. We've got boom arms again, so hopefully this sounds and looks a lot better. And we have an interesting episode with someone who runs a pretty fucking relevant business to this podcast, I guess. Mothership. Dot mm. AI, is that part of the name or is that just the no, domain? It's, no, it's just the domain name. I, I think actually we kind of um, got way ahead of the trend there with getting a dot AI mm. uh, couldn't domain. Couldn't afford the dot com. Couldn't afford the dot com at the time. Yeah. So so now, so now we're probably going to raise a billion dollar round at this point with the yeah. AI, AI domain. No. Uh, yeah, it's The Mothership is the name, The Mothership Group. And you buy D2C brands and yeah, scale them? Yeah, we, we buy D2C brands and scale them. So we, we basically are, um, you might have seen the kind of e-com aggregation model kick off a little bit in the last couple of years um, with loads of people in the US and the UK starting to buy Amazon businesses. That's kind of where it all yeah. started. Um, we do that, but really focused on direct-to-consumer businesses. Um, so we buy big brands, probably about two to 10 million of revenue. So that kind of small to medium size um, and uh, hopefully make them bigger, really is the, is the goal. Buy brands, make them bigger, and then uh, make a bigger company. And you've been doing that two and a half years? Yeah, ish. so founded in March 21. Um, we, yeah, so we actually started initially doing Amazon. So we, we basically looked at the US, said, okay, loads of Amazon businesses, that makes sense, scalable, the model looks amazing um, and a group of us got together and said okay let's do this now in the UK uh, we were slightly behind the curve I guess in terms of uh, as we started the business two UK aggregators raised a lot of money mm. and uh, partly due to that um, kind of being slightly behind the curve and actually partly due to kind of actually getting into buying businesses and realizing what uh, Amazon businesses were like and actually the long-term view of what an Amazon business is um, we started to think actually D2C is a better play here. The reason for that is basically, A, the first business we bought, 100% Amazon business. I mean, in many ways, a great business sells lots of useful things for not very much money, but for a tiny margin. But it's not a brand, right? Like it's a product play. It's all about playing the game on Amazon in a really effective way. You can. It's about buying media in a really st- structured and strategic way. It's about positioning your imagery in a really good way to catch the eye in the search, um, in the kind of search results. But you're not creating value. You're not creating any connection with customers. You're not really creating a great product that people, um, or rather you, you're not incentivized necessarily to create a product that people want to come back to your brand and buy another thing and buy another thing. And you're so- a bit of a moat really. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a massive, massive issue with competitors and moat. And so I think the long-term value for us really is is in direct consumer. And that's kind of where we started to, to, to push towards. And um, yeah, that's what we did. So we bought our first 100% consumer brand in March 22 and that's the that was the start of our kind of D2C journey how do you go from studying philosophy at Cambridge to buying D2C brands <laughs> right but it's the same. Uh, yeah god education I actually what? studied history of art not philosophy but uh, is it not philosophy I no. was on your LinkedIn my research is shit no no it's, I think it might I think the, the LinkedIn things you master know, of you, philosophy MPhil yeah, in yeah, art yeah, history that's okay a, that's a masters yeah yeah I did um, yeah I don't know 
that's a that's a weird story i don't really understand i i kind of was worried you're going to ask like where i came from and the kind of life story and i really don't really understand how i ended up here from my degree but um the reality of the situation is that i actually was born into a family of entrepreneurs really so that's that's why i started i like the idea of starting a business um i grew up my i've got three half brothers and uh, one full brother uh, all of whom started businesses and my dad's started multiple and so mostly in the kind of culture and art space so i i kind of like the art history is kind of a big love of mine yeah so um yeah exactly i like that makes more sense than jumping from there to to econ (laughs) yeah yeah and then i what basically what happened is that i at the age of 16 you know like i was quite a um i guess i was quite a uh, I'm still, still probably am quite a stubborn person. I thought you were going to say autistic. No, because <laughs> I, I feel like all entrepreneurs are fucking autistic. No, I was, I was quite a stubborn person, and so I think at the age of sixteen, I basically declared, like, to my mum, I'm going to go to Cambridge and study history of art, and that's what I want to do. Hmm. Um, and she was like, "That's the most unemployable degree you could possibly imagine. Why are you doing that?" But it's Cambridge, it's but it, all right. and that's kind of was my argument. And she was like, "No, but it is unemployable, though, <laughs> you know." Um, but I, I, and I wanted to work in the art world, and um, and that's what I wanted to do. And then basically, uh, I don't really understand why, but after you know four years of really intense studying, well probably longer than that, from 16 to 21, uh, really intensely doing it. Obviously loved, absolutely loved my degree. I, was, I still really love art. I'm still quite into art. Mm. Um, but I got to this point where I was like, actually, I don't know if I want to work in that thing. I want to kind of keep it as a, a passion, a love, but I wanted to do something totally different. I think a lot of my family kind of work in and around art my dad publishes art books and stuff so um i felt like i wanted to do something co- totally different um and so after a little sojourn deciding i wanted to be a professional singer uh, full time <laughs> which is another story um i ended up going into marketing digital so and then you know you go into digital marketing then you're like in the startups ecosystem space and then it's and then it it, it was kind of jumping into different projects um, one I, I started as a, a marketing company called MVF Global, and then yeah, went and did like startupy things, and then someone called you up, called me up, and said, "Hey, do you want to start a business together?" And I was like, "Yeah, grand. Why not?" Who do you currently? Is that the what's the structure of ownership for Mothership? Uh, in you? what sense? Is it just you? Uh, or it's or not just me. Yeah, no, no, there's a there's a group of us. So there's there's a group of six of us. So it's a big group of founders, which is an is interesting. There is six because I was looking at this article. I thought were they employees or founders? No, no, it's um uh, six of us. So what are their backgrounds? Uh, it's a really interesting mix. So the the guy who, six co-founders is that yeah. how, is that how you would describe it, or is it six yeah. six co-founders? That's a lot of co-founders. Yep. And um, yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting style of business mm. because you essentially instead of starting with like one or two people who are like, how do we work this stuff out? You kind of start with a well, the idea was you start with a ready-made team. Yeah. So, you, so and my background was in performance and got like growth in like growing businesses. Mm-hmm. So I was the growth person. We got uh, another colleague of mine who was a big um, like. PPC specialist, he would do a lot of the Amazon PPC. We've got a data and analytics specialist. So so the idea was we kind of had, we had a design specialist. Um, so we had like a group of people who could really hit the ground running as we bought our first business. Um, and the background, so the, the chairman, who's the guy who kind of brought everyone together, is a guy called Titus Sharp, amazing name. Um, and he really? actually started the first business that I worked for. So that right. MVF Global business, he started that. So that's the connection right. really. And he actually brought all of us together in different ways um and then the ceo and him are i think they're friends because their kids go to school together but the ceo Mm. is like a serial entrepreneur um guy called ben fletcher so um the idea was we would bring together that entrepreneur entrepreneurial experience people who've done it before people who know how to raise money for example big big piece of the puzzle and then the operational side and then we'd be able to sort of execute faster and better than a lot of people and we'd have this angle in the market which is basically like a lot of the people who raise a lot of money are from 
like PE backgrounds or accountants. Don't they don't really to allocate capital in ecom. Yeah, so. they're like they're not. They're, I guess there's this, there's that thing of like by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. Like we can mm. we can speak to people about marketing in a useful way. Like I can, I can have a call with a founder and talk about his Facebook ads and ad structure, or I can yeah. have a call with Ollie and feel like I can actually like have a useful conversation with an agency about how how things work. Um, and 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 that and for founders, I think that gives gives us a bit of an edge in the market. That was the idea. So was the idea always to buy brands? Was it to start brands? Idea was always to buy brands, but it's an interesting uh, conversation. We keep on coming back. We keep on circling back to this question of should we start a brand? And I have oscillated between where I am. I, I actually am in this point where I'm kind of against it. Starting or buying? Starting. Um, interesting. The reason being that I think one of the biggest problems when you start to basically try and run five, six, 10, 50 businesses at once is is prioritization. If you imagine what it's like to try and prioritize for one brand, like hmm. doing that five times over is, in, is really, really difficult. And we need to understand what the like trade-offs are for our model versus a single brand model. And one of the trade-offs is we can't be good at everything. So we should be good at fewer things that move the needle for a brand that's already got value. So I think the, the 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 struggle of getting to product market fit shouldn't need to be our problem. Like I think we mm. should be able to start good new products of high quality for the brands that we have. But the thing we want to buy is the really 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 hard bit because essentially you're kind of outsourcing that to entrepreneurs yeah. and then giving them that that exit. But I think if we try and do that well, trying to do that well requires so much extra skill set and it's such a different style of skill set from people who probably just want to be doing that themselves. I don't know if that actually gives us the best opportunities to, to succeed in the kind of business we are. So I'd much prefer to- That's opposite. We're doing the exact opposite as you starting like really? one brand a quarter. Yeah. And doing the product. Cause I think getting product market fit, like it's not that hard. Like it, mm. it is, cause you're not going to do it with every brand. Everything you launch isn't to do product yeah. market fit, but you just pick one channel. Yeah. Make some good landing pages. Well, pick, make your products, pick, pick meta. Write out your angles, write out your hooks. Have a good, you need to be very good at content, performance, market, yep. post click, nothing else to get to product market fit. And have good economics, you mm. economics, and a good economical setup, either good LTV to CAC ratio, which you, so you'll you say you won't realize for a long period of time, but you can set up a business so it's got favorable economics from the start and then get into product market fit. But then you are going to find that not every idea you come up with is going to work. So there's an element of trial and error still. Yeah, I think I think this is the. I mean, but then as I said, I've kind of jumped between the two, and I think there is an act, it's an active debate that continues in where we are. I don't think it's like settled. Um, so, I think I think a what is clearly like you guys are both really good operators, right? And um, we are learning how to be better operators. We really came with the idea oh, so of we. like, <laughs> yeah, of course. But like, I don't, you Not know, great. I I'm supposed to run the kind of growth yeah. function, and I didn't have an econ background. Now I know how to run a Facebook account. But like the rude awakening of what it's like to run an e-com business digitally mm. is has been a learning curve that has been ama like amazing for me. But I d definitely think, as all business owners are, we were really naive when we started it, and um, and I think the learning curve is massive. To to the point about like how many ideas are going to win, I think that's the other piece for us, which is that we have to be really smart with our capital. And if we've got a million pounds to spend on one thing, is it, could we, and we could, well, a million pounds is probably not enough, but like if we could buy a million pounds of profit with four million pounds, right? Yeah. Is it that, or, you know, how many ideas would it take for that four million pounds to generate a million pounds of profit? We don't know. Yeah. And so there's that kind of certainty. We know what we're buying when you're buying a, a great brand versus that kind of constantly taking those bets. So. I think it is a balance and again it comes back to this key problem which we always have which I think every business has but is you know is which is just there's this endless list of to-dos which we're going to do there's this endless opportunity yeah, list think, what are we going to do so I think choosing the right tasks with asymmetrical returns is probably one of the biggest differentiators for, for brands and businesses mm. like people who spend time doing things that the wrong thing spending time on yeah. the wrong thing and not being able we to We did spot. a fucking direct mail campaign last week. Oh, how did it go? was not so my idea. One of my staff members received that. Yeah. yeah. And it's like... We've been thinking about there's it. There's a lot... 
it was absolutely shit. As I thought, we should have spent 10 grand more on Instagram. There's a, a huge... I, mean, I think having, so far, the CAC is like 700 quid. But yeah. is the attribution window not longer? Like I'm sure it is, but I also think the attribution is probably really shit in general. Yeah, that's true. It's so, a, yeah, the way you'd have, how did you do it? Did you do like an incrementality test in one region and then just measure know. that versus? I, 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 I wasn't like responsible. The same way you'd run a team. <laughs> I, the quite, the way, I guess it was, but it wasn't my idea. I want to come back to the, I, I, so the way I would do that is like pick a town or city and do an incrementality test of I'm going to keep everything the same across the country. This is the only way to really measure attribution. Yeah. Is do it that's how you do an out of home I do it like same, same with TV if you're going to do it like maybe yeah. pick Newcastle run it in Newcastle leave yeah, everything else the same well. and measure your lift on like a model mm. let's see that's for me and then you, then you can kind of apply it to it or you do like an incrementality test where you have like a BAU exclusion increase by 50% in the other, split, other region and then measure it off that mm. I don't know, but yeah, it's hard to track out of home. I that, that you didn't need that was a waste of money for you at that stage. Like I, yeah, I think I a, agree. I'm a big proponent for e-com brands of just do less, better. Like do Facebook. Yeah, I completely agree. Don't. I spend, think there's so much you, fluff going on right now. And I, I agree. Just my hair right. And then, but then this is, comes back to the question: It's like, oh, do you want to start a brand? It's like that would be really cool. But also, I you know we've got to yeah do, do less, less better. better. Like do what you do. Just run. I Facebook still think we need to need to run Facebook. Yeah, and do a bit of TikTok. And it obviously, f- Facebook exactly. and retention, and then TikTok. TikTok's good for top of funnel and ra- raises your ceiling when you get saturation on Facebook pretty well. Yeah. What do you reckon saturation p- point is on Facebook in terms of scale? It depends on each brand. Well, I've been We've thinking got, about this a lot recently because yeah, some people said to me, "Oh, you've, you've you've hit the ceiling for UK one product, one channel." I think we're like ten percent there. You need just more angles. Maybe ten percent. Depends on your total addressable market. How many angles your product yeah. can be marketed at what you're like I spoke to True Classic this morning the oh, fucking yeah. VP yeah. of growth or some shit they're cool and he said they're spending 450 grand a day on Meta yeah, yeah. I was like oh, <laughs> they're spending a hundred times what we're spending yeah. but they do crazy stuff they like optimise budget in day they like look at what's going like there you have it's to do really that stage. you can yeah. get you can and it get just made me think have. why the fuck are we doing a direct market <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, which I thought was a waste of time and for the record it is yeah that, that's so. the sort of thing you do to raise the ceiling on mm. when you when you're at like that that's so i think you get to a ceiling on meta eventually where it becomes a middle of funnel channel so it becomes yeah. you need to have a more of a top of funnel above it so you need to have like out of home tv tiktok influencer right yeah and then it allows you to spend more on meta over time because you've you've there's more awareness around it right i yeah, think yeah, there's yeah. a point at which you do reach that so you can get a saturation report if you meta reps if you ask yeah and you can get them off like other channels as well. We we use we just onboarded with a platform called Phosphor to Tev. Yeah, we, we spend four hundred and fifty grand a month on Meta for Tev, and I still think we can spend. Yeah, a month. Pro- probably so look at True Classic a day. Yeah, they spend. Yeah, them, yeah that's, that's so ridiculous. Much they spend across like one hundred and fifty regions, though, don't they? And they're profitable as well, right? They're profitable. Yeah, apparently, one hundred and fifty mil. They went from. They went from. He said. He said they did fifteen, forty, ninety, one fifty, and yeah, four. The years. way they did that was they <laughs> they, they, they aggressively localized across regions, though, which is quite clever. They just did. They did X amount in America, UK, Australia. Mm. Just did ripped every country. Yeah, apparently at one point they were advertising in like 190 countries. Yeah. They're just doing everything. But they also measure everything on a contribution margin per customer acquired, I think. I think that was how they measured. Like, oh. right, so they have, they understand. You've got to have a serious amount of data to be able yeah, to do Yeah, they that. understand. So they've under, they understand. He did, he did a limited supply podcast with Nick. Yeah, Farmer. that was it. He yeah. did like, a, they model the cost of sale down to like employee input so like labor input raw material input time input and then mm. they're able to model that up to a cac that's like, their margins can't be that massive right because it's it's t-shirts like, apparently I think they've got a pretty good aov though i think the aov is yeah. over a hundred dollars yeah, they said it was they sent it in packs and that's wow. just like simple funnel and then they also have got a lot of diversification but they got to 70 mil off one skew yeah six pack of t-shirts yeah, yeah that's that's, but that they also did an absolutely banging youtube ad their youtube ads like so so iconic I don't think I've seen that. I'll have to send you it, it's good. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, I, I think Tev can, like, in terms of products, in terms of total addressable market, it's quite comparable to that. Hmm. It's like just a just stupidly broad product. Yeah. Yeah. That is the benefit of and massive addressable market. Yeah, like, time, like your time ceilings massive. are really high and it, it also usually gives you more angles to advertise from, like more, more, more pain points for more people. Like we've got women, mm. men, attraction genders price saving they've got like yeah similar thing and as they bring out different products they, they bring out more angles mm. 
But yeah, I think the ceiling's higher than most people think on there. Okay. I went to a, um, I went to their offices last week, and it was like a AI day, and they're they're doing all sorts on in, on it in AI. Oh, it's you just, mentioned something today actually, which you said you should do um, language something. Have you heard of it? Where it like automatically translates ads? Yeah, the start in Facebook. They're bringing out oh, really? AI, AI yeah. sandbox, AI sandbox in Facebook, where you, basically it's a bit like mid journey in platform, but it'll be yeah. learning off everybody else yeah. using it, so it'll understand more about. What's a good yeah, app? Yeah, fuck. You get to okay. probably have to make creatives. Yeah, it would just be really that would be really mad. Or it'll be like, able to like you've got you need to resize for stories. You just ask it to do it, and it just moves right. yeah. it around. Yeah, that's where it starts. And like subtitles, like you say, moving like text to speech, so it goes to like fourteen different languages at the click of a button. But then moving the whole platform towards like high, like AI just back camp like ASC, which is like big AI company, yeah. and that'll th- probably lift the ceiling further. Yeah. But anyway, a bit of a tangent. But when you guys hard. are when you guys are looking at starting a one brand a quarter, how are you finding the products to start? We're so well, early in the process. Me. I ain't touching that. <laughs> <laughs> We're so early into the process. Purposes. So like a lot of them, are what like we've got another two fragrance brands because it's what what we've done. Right, we, we've got the supply chain logistics. We're niching Fine. into consumables. Right. Consumables have good. You start on a mushroom brand next. <laughs> yeah, yeah just it's called Space just Foods. <laughs> just like uh, LT, con, we we chose consumables for me. Give you the best again yeah, LTV to cut LTV to cut ratio, which sets you up for success in today's like. We've got three consumables brands. Yeah. We, it's great. Like fuck having a mattress brand that people buy once every fifteen years. Yeah. It's like that's why they all went for like 20, 2016 yeah look right? at Casper like just yeah. fuck having that so it's like yeah. I think that's where we start and then it's and then it's just like spotting opportunities a couple mm. of them we've 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 done one brand where we've seen a brand in America that haven't touched the UK really, really? and we're just like what they, they can't because of some some ingredients they have and we're just like let's just do that do that in the UK and Europe and do it to a slightly different USP um Stuff like that, just like spotting opportunities. So coming back to mothership, yeah. so you raised twenty two million dollars. Yeah, arguably b- before the global financial markets imploded. <laughs> Decent timing, I'd yeah. say. Yeah. That's, what, what day was On it? what grounds did you January. do that? Was that pre any acquisition, or no. and did you have any acquisitions lined up, and that was the premise to raise the money, or no? So we we we, we ran for about a year, pretty much bootstrapped. Um before raising the money. Quick one, fellas, you probably heard a few months ago I dropped an e-com course, a very fucking guru of me, but it's not that, I promise you. Zero to one, how to start a brand from scratch with no budget, some budget, a bit of budget, take your idea from a bedroom to reality to potentially seven, eight figures in sales like I've done a few times based on my seven years of experience in the trenches and my current experience building my current brand, Space Goods. It's no bullshit, no frills. We've had like 75 people go through so far. Not a single person has asked for a refund. Plenty of people have actually built some seriously impressive shit. Covers every aspect of the business, not just the front end stuff like most gurus on YouTube and Twitter are talking about, not just product, market and all that shit, but the real shit, the logistics, the back end, the supply chain, the customer service, the finances as well. This covers the whole spectrum, every part, 12 hours of video. If you're interested in scaling a brand, zero to one, actually turning our idea finally into a reality, then click the link below, go check out Learn Real Commerce course and let me know what you think. I'd be glad to have you in there. Let's fucking go. So we bought we bought basically two brands mm. with money that we raised kind of from the founders right. and um so but they were both well they were both predominantly amazon brands one was like 100 percent amazon the other one was the one we were kind of testing on the d2c side um which was a consumables brand our pets brand um yeah. and we basically ran those uh for a year before before raising i think the reason to do that were kind of i think actually looking back we probably could have raised more money without if we'd raised earlier i think mm. the timing of the raise also got complicated but if we'd say if we'd raised in march 21 with no no brands and been like hey guys look look at all this money being raised we probably could have raised even more money but weirdly when you start to have proof points people want to dig into them yeah. they want to see what's good what's James bad. said that James Mishraki said that more due diligence yeah so it's better to raise pre-product because there's nothing to yeah. dig into there's nothing to see nothing right? to there's no data so it's to all about analyze. team yeah. it's all about team and actually like I think you, definitely you know definitely a lot of the senior people in, in, in the team have kind of good creds to, to say like we could do this um, so 
so I think we would have been in a really good position but we chose that to go the other way and I think the benefit that that gave us is really experiencing what it's like to run an e-com brand and we didn't and, and run an e-com brand in a lean way where you're like how, how are we going to make money what like we how do we cut costs like making sure we're, we're we're and basically what it's like to to feel the pain of it mm-hmm. like you're out of stocks the, yeah, where the hell is that pain. thing are oh, we're going to get taken down on meta like you know we got I, we started our meta account and you know because meta when you start spending a lot of money quite quickly you yeah. get flagged yeah. so yeah. we got banned <laughs> our account got deactivated like seven times in the first like four weeks mm. of running it was like that kind of thing where straight into negative cash flow. yeah exactly it was just like a nightmare <laughs> Ruthless. um so so that kind of thing it, it kind of gave us a bit of a bit of the war wounds to say when you get into the conversations with the kind of when future brands when you've raised some money when you're buying some, but when you're hiring more people you kind of know more what you want you're less idealistic i think and i think it set us up to be probably more resilient operators um then had we not because i think that naivety plus a lot of money Mm. can i mean often you can make an amazing business often there are amazing entrepreneurs who have just an idea raise a bunch of money and then go um but i think a lot of times it's good to get the kind of especially when you don't know the market that well and especially when e-com as is as complicated and um volatile as it can be i.e like supply chains are really volatile you never know what's going to happen you might you might get banned you might get taken down there might be a competitor comes in um so there might just good. be like problems of any kind of any kind to really experience those i think puts us in a good position um or at least that's the hope and how was it set up day to day then so you buy some brands at the start who was actually working on was it just the team of six or do you, you already hire a team so um, at the beginning uh, we we hired a couple of people um, so we hired uh, our kind of operational person to help us with like transitions and like because there's so much like crap to yeah. go like all the legals and when you buy the business you know transferring over all the accounts hmm. the, um, you know they one runs on Zendesk another one runs on Gorgeous Mm. what are you going to do with all like it is a night there's a lot of like nightmarish stuff underneath the bonnet which is nothing to do with the business you buy it's just to do with fitting that into the other businesses you have like if one's on wucom we have a brand on wucom and Why? it's well, i don't know but like it's a great brand right yeah. but like it's a great yeah. brand it's on wucom it's like there's a massive risk here to move it off wucom but we everything else is on shopify and mm. we want to be a shopify special you know that like, so like you lose the roll-up efficiency exactly if you don't don't move everything to the same thing. So timing that, working out how that has to happen, what the risks are, all of that required some operational stuff. Um, a financial person, so we've, we've got an amazing CFO um, who is, yeah, just totally brilliant. And he um, basically helped us with the, because you have to imagine like part of our business is essentially, and not that I ever really knew I was getting into this, but essentially part of our business is like a micro PE firm, right? Mm. So we have to be investors and therefore we have to do really like, we have to think financially. We have to think yeah. about debt and leverage and um, and then we have to do the deals. We have to think about how the deal is going to be structured, what the earnouts are going to be, if there are going to be earnouts, what the SPA, what the multiple, all of those things. So you, so having a really good financial person was really important. And then we just hired a couple of really good grads, um, basically. Um, and a, and, a, and um, thankfully, we had um, a contact um, who was willing to do logistics. So nice. we had about a team of nine, ten, I think, in the first year running two businesses um, and then trying to raise money basically so um, the CEO and the chairman were really off trying to raise money and um, and it was kind of me and like yeah that group of probably yeah seven just running the businesses I want to dig into the running but I want to also ask first what do you look for in an opportunity for acquiring a brand like mm. what's what setups <coughs> like any like complete red flags and how did those first two come about did they come to you or vice versa good question as well uh i'll ask answer your one first so the 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 two first brands um came at the time where we started the business there were quite it was quite a quite a kind of frothy market of there were quite a lot of businesses out there and we did our first deal in literally 16 days and we the guy came to us I think I've got to remember this but I think I think he came to us and yeah we did the deal in 16 days we did it for a kind of fair multiple everyone was buying it he had like three offers and we just so the start of 2021 start of 20, just March before, 21 just before iOS 14 
March 2021. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Mm. So That's dumb. when my previous business went into administration. <laughs> yeah. So I've what done deals. I've there's, done deals. There's one flame. Yeah. It's pre-packed. It's extinguished. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. So and then the next one. Um, I can't. I can't remember. I, basically, our, our our chairman was sort of one of the reasons why he was kind of excited by the idea and stuff is he really enjoys the process of buying businesses and likes to find deals so he was off finding deals and ferreting around and so I think the first one came to us and then we I think reached out to the second one and we got put in touch with this manufacturer in Wales who manufactured supplements they were manufacturing consumables uh, like protein powders um, yeah supplements various things and they had a couple of brands and one of which they were looking to offload so we bought that um, and that was uh, pretty quickly. It was about three, four months after our first one. Is that the one um, I know of? That well, that's that well. Not, no, not no, that one. No, no. no. Um, that was our third brand. Okay. Um, so, so that that yeah, and that was a pets pet supplement brand. And so, so but but like across the portfolio, we've had a real balance, real mix. But actually, our best leads generally are people who come to us either because they hear about us or they are actively shopping their brand like quite a lot of people are actively shopping their brand um there are a lot of brokers in the space but we haven't as far as i remember that no we haven't had any um any deals come through we had plenty of deals we've looked at come through brokers we haven't actually closed any um partly because um the deals are a lot more competitive it's hard to get a decent price and obviously coming back to that thing about part of us is a you know we've got to be part of us is like got to have a real financial head on we need mm. to make sure we're getting the right price for the brand that we're buying. Um, so, and I think there were a lot of people in the space who raised lots of money and got very excited and just started buying a lot of things and didn't necessarily realize that at some point you're gonna have to realize you paid quite a lot of money that, for something that might not make, make all that money back. So you've got to be really careful, I think. And we were caught comparatively to other aggregators in the market. I think we've been relatively cautious. Conservative, yeah. Um, I can't remember your question. What was it? I just asked, like, what do you look for in terms of buying a brand? Oh, right. So, yeah. I, I guess. And how is that? Well, I, I keep adding on to God, it. I'm going to forget I guess everything. Like, answer that. My, my, answer this I one. guess okay. an easy way to approach my question is like, what metrics do you look for? Are you looking for like first order profitability, 12 month profitability, like um, anything that's a big So, steer? I think when we first see a brand, there are sort of two things that we look at, two sides of the coin, right? The first side of the coin is the financials. Yeah. And we start higher level than that. We start really about like, what scale is it? Yeah. Um, and what is the kind of, we, we generally look at EBITDA. So we, we look at kind of net profitability um, and EBITDA. What, what's the margin there? We look for something that hopefully is 15% plus Mm -hmm. uh, on EBITDA margin, strong, um, EBITDA. strong margin, um, and probably um, you know from a consumables point of view, like if it's not profitable on first purchase, then profitable within probably a we're definitely within six months, but probably un 90 profitably days, ninety yeah, days. That's, um, that's kind of where we where we want to be. Um, then the then obviously there's the scale point of view. There's the actual growth of the brand like a lot of what we're also looking for is how sustainable is that growth because you know it could be that we take on that brand and it continues but also like we might not be great and we might fuck up in various ways so we want something that's got a good core um and if the gr business is growing really naturally well then that and in the finances it's showing that that that's a really good sign for us and obviously we pay a premium for for growing brands that kind of brings me to the other side of the coin which is really about um like Product, value of product, reviews, brand equity, brand equity, equity yeah. moats, defensibility, like coverage in various countries, like all of the kind of other bits that are really important to us. Um, we have a kind of stated, a, a proportion of our company is owned by an environmental and social good foundation that we we set up called the the M Foundation. That that um, I don't even know if it's launched properly yet. But um, <laughs> I don't know if I should say that. But um, but yeah, but a, a part of it is is launched by. But so we we have a kind of a, a certain piece of our our business. It's really looking for brands that do social good. Um, the idea of the foundation is that as we grow, we will give more because um, equity of the business is owned by the foundation, so they will have a, a amount of cash. And it's a kind of a way of saying, look, ecom isn't great for the planet, but mm. if we can do better as we grow, then that's a good thing. But it also means that when we're looking for brands, we want brands that we think 
have we call it we talk about lovability something that people will really love will 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 they they will that is good for the planet that people enjoy um vouch for yes as well you get yeah people will vouch for and like and there's one way of seeing seeing that that's about like it and i think it is a real stated aim of ours and it's something about like not wanting to kind of leave a really horrible wake of stuff that we don't like yeah. in, in the world. But the other part is that, yes, a lot of these brands also tend to have really strong unit economics, have strong brand equity, have products that people care about and that deliver on the promises that they make to people. And I think when you think about what bra- what the brands are that we would love to buy, it's brands that really deliver on their promises um, because that creates equity and that creates repeat repeatable customer. I imagine some of those have bigger moats as well. Like it's probably harder yeah. to make a sustainable version of a product than it is just a ripper. I agree. Hard, harder to make like a sustainable plastic cup than a plastic cup. I think <laughs> I think that's true. And like and I think and I think it, it is also true that the stated these stated aims and these wishes are also really challenging yeah. to execute when you're in the market. And for example, right now where a lot of e com brands are really struggling and um multiples in general in the market are down so you're going to get less bang for your buck if you're a, yeah. if you're a founder you're like well i could have sold for i don't know seven times six times five times and i'm going to sell for three times four times you know that 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 so really good businesses are like mm, i'm not so sure and the businesses that want to sell are often maybe having a more difficult time so i think finding a really good business that we can do a deal that makes the founder happy and that we're really excited by the business has become is, is harder than it has been, um, but and we're, but we're definitely you know we're, we're still really excited about some of the businesses we're looking at. We're always kind of actively looking for acquisitions, um, and I think we're still seeing some good brands out there. But the deals are like it, it t- takes longer, right? You How many brands do you own now? Then we have five two originally. We have five, and as I said, you know, it comes back to that piece where. You know, you could have had someone from an aggregator on this podcast who's bought 50 brands, right? And and that would be a really interesting podcast. I can introduce you to those people. They're cool people. But um, I think they are operating a really different business to, to where we are yeah. um, for various reasons. I think we've decided that, A, we don't want to raise a lot of venture money. So our money, the, the, the money that we have raised has come from a group of made, amazing kind of angels and, and kind of family offices. Yeah. And one of the reasons why that is, is that we don't want to be p- pushed into a game of growth at all costs. We want to yeah. be thinking about how we maintain our profitability, how we create a sustainable business for us and for our investors and how, we, yes, how we grow, but also how we um, kind of maintain a good amount of shareholder value um, for the people who kind of really done a lot of the, a lot of the work. Um, so um, we've been more conservative and also we want to get good at operating. I, you know, so. I think I that's like, the thing, right? Like, I feel like from your position, it'll probably be you'll probably be acutely aware when it's the right time to buy another one. Yeah, and like I feel like there's, there's that point in every business. So when you're in it, you're like, oh, now is the right time to try and actually grow again, rather than being too like forceful with it. What? So with five brands, mm-hmm. you might have been about to ask this: Do you have a team that works? You have separate teams in each brand, or do you have oh. teams that work on? I, Marketing is covered by a team for five brands. Operations is covered for five brands. You know. I want to ask a quick prequel to that. I've never understood what would be best. See, we're in the we're in the middle of deciding this as well for our group. Yeah. But I want to ask a pre prerequisite to that: when you acquire a business, does the team come with it, or has the team ever come with it? Yes. Right. Okay. So that's interesting um, in itself as well. So we we have acquired businesses where none of no one comes. Uh, we acquired a business uh, and that's kind of usually how we did it like a lot of the brands we bought so far some of the most of the brands we bought so far have been relatively small um, which relates to your point and I'll come to it um, and so they've been kind of one two person teams or they've been like the Lee. founder and a group of his family and nice. stuff who are like I don't want to come and work for some random person I don't know I'm your mum like I'm going to do it for you like you know what I mean like literally, <laughs> literally I mean yeah, it's, yeah, it is yeah. amazing I mean it's incredible to see what like the other thing is it is incredibly humbling to see like what people have managed to make with like you know yeah. bootstrapping their like finding it's an crazy. angle and like making an amazing product that really delivers right um, and so so I think uh, but but we have bought we also have bought businesses where we've come with a team I think the max 
or we bought a business actually came with a warehouse which had a full team so that was massive and then they also had a full customer service team which we bought on because customer service is you know getting a good customer service team is is really really important and they have a our customer service team are brilliant um they, they and they had a few people in in places and skill sets that we needed so i think we ended up bought bringing in total maybe 13 14 people in nice. with one brand um which was massive for us but that was a challenge massive so. massive challenge um especially when you're because <clears throat> some of those people were so our warehouses in scotland and some of our team are now in ukraine so there was a whole other set of it's complicated complications That's right really complicated, that yeah. you're coming with some people in algeria some people in canada like so, so it was a very different style of business that you're suddenly managing and that culture. was a huge yeah. huge challenge but i think thanks to the amazing work that we that kind of our operations team has done and kind of a lot of um, work we've done from the cultural point of view I think we're in a really good place with it but it's taken a long time um, so so yeah um, in terms of how do you run five brands each individual team versus one brand um, I think that is a that has been a challenge and a question that we have been um asking ourselves since day one and I think we have literally just kind of adjusted so for a while we were kind of running we, we've we never been uh, five five different teams um, deployed into five different brands for two reasons really for one reason which is essentially like the size of the P&L the size of the profit that we're buying for most of those brands does can't justify the cost of the team mm -hmm. because if you buy say I don't know Say it's got a hundred grand of profit to make the maths easy, right? And you put sixty k of cost in there, you just lost so much of your profit that mm. it, it's it's crazy. So you have to get, and the model sort of relies does rely on essentially efficiencies of scale. So you have to be able to say like this one person can work on multiple brands, yeah. and that's your efficiency, and that's how the model starts to work. Um, but for a while, we were kind of working a bit more in silos in the sense that we had a couple of Amazon brands and we had some D2C brands and essentially the Amazon team were kind of working over here and the D2C team were working over here and they were all kind of doing their own thing but there wasn't much kind of portfolio level management and that meant that I think everyone was sort of not really knowing what the priority was because everything was a priority. Yeah. And the fear, right, the fear always from our point of view is that we'll come to an investor meeting and they'll look at your, so we've only got five brands. If you've got 50 brands, it's kind of different. If you've got two bad brands and 50 brands, two brands, like things have gone wrong. They're like, oh, don't worry about it. If you've got five brands and one of them has gone wrong or two of them have gone wrong, that's like 20 to 40% of your portfolio that they're like, are you very good at this? I don't think you're very good at this, mm. you know? And that could be in your control, that could be out of your control. Like e-com, things can change at any point. And we definitely made mistakes and learned from them, but we're also definitely nowhere near the level of operating that we want to be. Like we need to be a hell of a lot better than we are, right? Um, but, uh, you know, we we were so scared of that conversation of like, you know, you, you're this one brand is really bad, like get out kind of thing, yeah. that we were trying to make everything good. And when you're trying to make every brand a priority, then nothing becomes a priority and actually you're exacerbating the problems that are already there. So the decision we've just made is essentially to start to manage everything where essentially you have one marketing team. So we used to have these brand managers, like um, brand, each, there was one person who owned the P&L for each brand, essentially, mm. although essentially it was like me and a couple of other people mm. who owned the, the P&Ls for like five brands. But the idea is you'd have this kind of owner and they'd be entrepreneurial, they'd be finding opportunities and then essentially taking them to the teams and being like, hey, I've got this opportunity. And the team would be like, how does that rank in our priorities and we'll do whatever that priority works. But in reality, that didn't really work. It just meant that those brand managers were kind of trying to get people to do work, but nothing was really happening. I think instead, we've gone to this, sorry. Um, yeah, instead, we've gone to this level where essentially we've got to have one marketing team, we're going to have a commercial team, we're going to have a creative team and they'll sit under one kind of growth division. Then we're going to have logistics, finance, operations. And, loans. And, then, yeah. Yeah. And, then, and then we'll manage everything from a portfolio basis. And mm. that at the very least means we can take advantage of the biggest opportunities in the business. And that's the most important thing. That's, that's how we're going to do it, I think. Yeah. So, so I think you get knowledge efficiency at scale then. You get, you get yeah. context efficiency, yeah, cross-sectional efficiency. You learn from each brand. 
a media buyer managing it's like a media buyer managing five accounts in an agency media yeah. buyer managing five of your own accounts I think I think, I think that thinking about it more like an agency actually sort of helps because then you can you maybe structure it do you know the thing I'm struggling with recently <laughs> this is probably way too public and team members may be listening because um, like I know you can scale to a million a month basically as a one man brand because I've done it it did break but I've done it and like just a few freelancers but then at the same time you hear people being like our oh, team is everything you've got to build like yeah. everyone's got to be full time employee in an office I'm constantly torn between I can scale to three million a month on a laptop with freelancers because I think it's doable and no we need an office everyone's got to be PAYE in the UK mm. I think I still can't decide I literally depends when you ask me what do I'm you very, want I think you, yeah, I want element. the best outcome for the business mm. I want to build the most valuable business so that's the North Star right. so then work back from that I think you but then this comes on to the interesting point as well of like is the only value in a business the P&L on the face of it maybe yes but then the potential longevity of it the investability of it say the like culture and I know that seems like a really buzzy word if you're like a fucking bedroom brand it probably is but at what point do those things start to matter as much as like the P&L do you know what I mean I think I think I don't think you should ever look at the business as, a, as any, any business as a pure P&L and I think that is um, a lesson that we have learnt and I think something that we really take seriously which is that essentially a great product and a great brand is way way more important in the long term mm, than so. than uh, a sexy P&L right now like I I have seen and I, this is no disrespect but I've seen like businesses that are doing like 10 million a month selling like back scratches on Amazon right yeah. and, and, and like those people make a lot of money and fair play right like TikTok dropshippers but yeah uh, but but like that brand probably isn't going to be around in, in five years right and or to the challenge to keep that brand around in five years when there are 10 other people making exactly the same product at half the price mm. is, is going to be really difficult because essentially I think every market goes through that period where you've got the first movers it goes to premiumization and then suddenly people start to make it cheaper they find more efficiencies yeah. and then you're in this 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 massive race to the bottom and we've had brands where like you're basically you survive you see brands that survive basically on sales or like literally like promotion alone mm. and they're in this race to the bottom and they're making this products getting more and more commoditized and they've got nothing to fall back on if you've got great brand if you've got a wonderful product that has either something that's defensible in terms of ip or actually just something where design from a design or manufacturing perspective you've got an edge um and you've got an engaged community with great social proof those are moats that can last you a lot longer and that means when that price products that 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 moment starts in the market i think you're in a much better position yeah I, I definitely agree I think uh, yeah I think it, more than P&L unless you've literally but, but you've not got the cash like if, if you've not got the cash then it is just pure P&L like you, obviously but that goes without saying I think the what you're talking about is like ec like brand it's, equity it's, yeah. it's, what you're talking about is like team structure still though it's like how right. are you going to structure this like how do you want and like all that matters in that in that not to a mill a month for me is getting people who fucking execute execute quickly and yeah. execute yeah. well and and also spend the time on the right things. That's what you've you said. Those brand managers, that brand manager position in your company, effectively for me, from what you said there is like they're looking at the business and spotting opportunities. That becomes the most important person yeah. in your organisation because if they spot the wrong opportunity at the wrong time and allocate resource to it, yeah. and it's a waste of money. And, and like it's direct not, mail, it's not even it's not even a waste of money. It's it's not only a waste of money. It's a waste of resource and time, which is more important. Mm. If you spend six months doing something that's just fundamentally, you should have spent six months doing something yeah. else and another hundred grand somewhere else. Yeah, that's, that's a very really true. fucking hard thing to do. And I think like people try to do that from like a a purely metrics perspective, but then you lack context and like mm. without the context on opportunity. Like an example that I really like of this is how pure sport have doubled down on community and that's mm. probably been like their biggest route to market and scale and it's built their brand as an example but they're still a pretty small scale but they're still not massive but like without numbers. doing that they wouldn't have they wouldn't have ran up Instagram and Facebook as the same scale as doing that but like that, yeah. was, a, that was a very so but they'd be a great example of a brand that would command well get your opinion on this so say they've got X p &L and another another Amazon brand's got the same p &L. They come Which one's way, more yeah, valuable? You command way more value exactly. as a DTC brand. I, I think you see that in the market, right? But also because like, they've got a community and yeah. they've got an actual brand. They've got thousands of people and, turning up at running clubs every week. Mm. Like that's something yeah. you can't well, 
built with, that's a moat that you can't replicate. So and, I, and people will absolutely pay a premium for that. And I, and I think that's reflected in the market, right? Amazon brands are generally cheaper than D to C brands. Mm. Um, I think the, the question relating to your point is it's sort of like, how easy is the pivot? Like if you get to a million a month with your with freelancers from a laptop and then you go like, I want to go to 10 million a month. How is it, how easy is it, is it to pivot while still scaling into the thing which you probably need where you have the team? And I think that's the question is like, what are you setting yourself up for Yeah. from the beginning? If you're saying, well, actually the goal here is, and I guess and this is a silly way of putting it, but it's, if it's like, you know, a hundred mil or bust, Hmm. then you set yourself up for 100 mil or you set yourself with a goal to get to 100 mil which probably means you'll need a great team in a, fucking you know, good people so yeah you need really good people really right? fucking good people and no bad people either no and average people people, people like, who trust you and will be there for a good amount of time yeah. whereas if you're like actually I'd be okay if it was 12 mil and I was on my own you know that that would be okay then maybe you're thinking a bit differently and I think I think there's no, there's no right or wrong way it just depends on what your goal is but if you do one and then you want to pivot to the other, how easy is that? And how about know. how about the brands you're buying then now? So, like, is the value add like is your intention to buy them and increase the P and L and sell them for a profit, mm. or is it to somehow build everything into this machine that becomes the mothership with in the future way more brands and then Using that the name, is valuable? Right? Yeah, if we're going to yeah. take off and go into space. Yeah, yeah. we're going to go and live on the moon. Yeah, um, I I think. Uh, the honest answer to that question is sort of we don't know. Uh, we had always intended, the, the real intention was to build a brand house. So build a group of brands that we love and that we can work with and continue to grow and build a machine that gets to a point where we can plug any brand into it and it can and we can grow it. And um, we can add value to it and we can grow um, its, its gross profit um, effectively over a five to seven year period and then, and then, and then beyond. That doesn't mean that at different points we won't want to look at our portfolio and say like, actually, we really want to be good at like, this. You know, the active example is like we have stated that we're going to be we want to be good at direct to consumer. And by the way, I kind of buy into the whole direct to consumer is just a channel. We want to be doing more. You yeah. know, we want to be a, a, a hub of consumer brands, which means we yeah. want to be really good at Amazon. We want to be really good at D2C. We want to be really good at retail. We want to be really good at out of home. We want to do really good at everything. Right. Yeah. Um, but if if we're spending too much time or one thing in the portfolio doesn't really fit that strategy for whatever reason then i think we would obviously take um a kind of educated decision to say actually you know this isn't the right thing for us and if we can sell it and we can get a good deal on it then it's absolutely um worthwhile doing and i think we should i don't think we should put ourselves into the box of saying oh we'll never sell a brand because absolutely we should and we should be doing the right thing for the business Mm -hmm. um and i think that's 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 kind of an active conversation for us um what, Interesting. What What do you think as a business right now you're really good at in terms of, and what do you think your weaknesses, where do you think your weaknesses lie? And if that's if you're willing to share those, because it's quite like a big question. I think that's a, I, I wish that was a, a yeah, maybe not, it's probably not an answer. easy question to answer, but like, I, I guess from a, that's a really hard question because you were, I def, you've only just, I've only just learned that you learn own logistics, customer service. So it's probably really hard when you've got all of that going on. But like, well, I think, I'm I think, talking more market, I guess, just background. Well, but like, look, I think the thing we're good at, I think one of the things we're really good at, um, or, or at least we, we feel really confident in, is um, on the data analytical financial side. Not because we're accountants. A, we have a brilliant CFO that really helps us. And I think he, you know, he is it really helps the business. But I think myself uh, and a lot of our co-founders and senior team are like very comfortable with the data part of everything. Can look at numbers. Can 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 find opportunities. I think that's uh, a and, really good base. And we're we're re- we're good at that. And I think we back ourselves on that. Um, and the kind of commercial aspects and finding good deals. Yes. Yeah. I think the thing that we need to get better at is more on the marketing execution. So it's the it's the bit above that, which is the stuff that I feel like I don't know, Matt. You're probably really good at, right? Which is that like finding angles, testing stuff, creatives, like thinking about how we can be really kind of interesting in the marketing, how we can grab attention, how we can continually um, like test great landing pages. I think there's that, and I think there's also like from a technical point of view, for just tech in general, like our data infrastructure is really bad. 
Yeah. Um, like we, it, building a landing page is, it just takes so much longer than we want, like mm. unbelievably long. I've got a great um, hack for you Replo, is it? Are you being yeah, I've got, I've but got, I still do it myself I've got because I'm not paying some kind of three to. grand a page to do it when I can do it myself in two hours. I've got a yeah. hack for you though, I'll tell you after. <laughs> hack? Mm. Off, um, off, off pod. Uh, right. Yeah, off the pod, off the pod. Um, um, yeah, yeah, so like tech, I think it's basically like, I think we've got a great marketing team and I, I'm, you know, I think they're doing a great job, but I, I feel like that's the bit where I kind of feel like we need to move faster. We need to be testing more angles, better angles. We yeah, need to same. know our customers better. Like, I think we also just, I think that's, yeah. I think we need to spend more time with our customers. Like I, I, it's very easy to get into this position where you look around the office and you ask the question like, who's talked to a customer in the last six months? And there's no one in the room who's talked to a customer and knows anything about a customer. Surveying them. Like, yeah, mm. we're, like, product, we're like not productizing, but we're making a big SOP around that to yeah. give away at the moment. Cause I think like, it's massive, right? And I think, so I think it's that, ang- that part and the tech part, I, I'd say we, we aren't we aren't so good at, and then we need we need to get better at. Um, but as I said, there's that thing about startups, and we are still very much a startup. It, it's funny because you you buy lots of revenue, right? Mm-hmm. So you've got lots of revenue, and your P and L looks fat, and you're like, oh, we're no longer a startup. We're 50 people, and then you're like, but we've only gone for two years. We've got no idea what we're doing. We're still like hacking everything together. And I think one of the things is that kind of everything is in its own way broken right it's mm-hmm. not it's not working well enough and if i don't think i don't think anyone's a good entrepreneur unless they're the, the, the natural instinct of an entrepreneur is to look at everything and be like oh that could be better i could do better we could do better we want to do better mm. we want to constantly yeah. do better so 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 there's ever at any point in the business you could point out stuff that isn't good enough yet um but the most important thing is we are making real steps to get better and and i think the blessing in disguise is that we aren't we didn't raise 100 million quid and we aren't a 50 brand business Just because actually we're problems, really we're yeah. really focusing on getting better at, at executing and and the business model is there and will continue to be there so on the website it has a get evaluation button yeah it's obviously like a lead form how mm. many how many good well how many brands in general do you get filling that in and how many do you speak to and how many become a viable acquisition prospect um well i i, I think it's and also that versus you outreaching to brands yeah so so um as i said before like a lot of our best leads have come from that form mm. or kind of direct email intros um and generally that's because yeah as he said as i said people are shopping their brands or they hear about us we're on kind of some lists or you know they hear a podcast they hear see us at an event i mean we're not massively out there and i think one of the things we need to do is is get our names out a bit bit more but generally people who come with a good amount of intent they're more ready they you know a big part is like a lot of things that aggregators say is like get your numbers ready know who you what you're trying to do it's kind of it's nice to feel like if someone's coming to you and say hey i'm thinking about doing this they, they generally are more prepared for the conversations that then follow which is like can you send us your pnl can you send us some data about your company what's 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 going on and, and those conversations generally are easier when that intro is warmer um I do also have to shout out our um, our outreach though, because you talk about direct mail. We we really like direct mail for our reach, but we do it in a in a different way. So we we do like handwritten letters, really high personalization. Yeah. yeah, I assisted an M and A firm doing that when I was nineteen on yeah. a work placement, and yeah. they literally wrote letters to it's businesses really they wanted to buy. But you can do it. You can do it. You don't actually just have to do it yourself. You can do this this thing called Roboquill. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, like yeah. I've got some more called Handy Written. Same yeah, thing. Yeah, same it's like thing. an actual yeah. robot yeah. writes it. I've never used it yet. I need I, to use it. It's I cool. It's to justify for smaller transactions, but I think it could work. Re- that could work really well for influencers at scale for DC runs. Oh yeah, it's, like, my it's only three quid a pop. Yeah, so it's yeah. do a hundred a month, say. Yeah. Um, and we we've yeah, done things like idea. we've sent them chocolate. We send people chocolate. We say like we really love your brand. Like on Valentine's Day, we'll send them Valentine's chocolate. And stuff like there's that's that kind of thing where like we've done we've done quite some fun things we also did the best thing actually was we went through a phase where when we closed the deal we'd send brands a cake replica of their product as a thank that, you that that so i've got really a, a product i've got a photo on my phone at some point of someone getting like a massive jar of like pet supplements as a cake yeah it's yeah. kind of hilarious like, I can that's sick. what's the biggest deal you've done uh revenue business about eight million and did you pay, how much did you pay for that? No, I'm not going to tell you that. Can't say. Can't say that. What was EBITDA? I don't know if you can say that. I don't know if I can say that. Uh, what multiple did you pay? On it. Can't say. Uh, the multiple was strong. That was a, a very good deal. I'd say maybe that's the wrong, like that's the biggest business we bought. Was that pure D2C, not Amazon? Uh, that, they tried a bit of Amazon, but it was pure D2C. Um, nice. Business before that, I mean, 
the biggest EBITDA business we bought is uh, about 800k, I think, somewhere around there. Yeah, so small business. So small business. I think any, anything doing 10 to 15 percent EBITDA. 15 percent in e-commerce is very solid. Yeah, it's very solid, especially right? in this market. It, it, well, and and this is and I think, I think this is also the point, which is especially in this market. So coming to your point, which is like the the challenge for us is like how much are we willing to move move down yeah. from that bit where you're like, oh, is this business like because okay, so aggregators I think have got a fair amount of flack because there was this thing that happened where like loads of businesses, especially Amazon businesses, are getting bought by aggregators and they were seeing their businesses drop off a cliff, right? Yeah, because aggregators essentially we're trying to run two in businesses at once and didn't know what to do um, but there is a real risk that we buy a business and we screw it up and we've definitely yeah. bought businesses like we bought a business where you know CAC or CPA has I mean gone from like 18 quid when we bought it uh, profitable first purchase to like 50 quid now yeah. and it and like we have put, a lot of it's an issue now yeah still an issue now we've we, we've put I mean, I cannot tell you how many hours we put into that brand. Like we've done, we've do it. We're trying as best we can. We've you done so much. Ads now, don't you? Let me give, let me do a free audit. Let me see if we can. Yeah, do a free audit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do an audit on my account again. Yeah, we're working on your account. I've gone you from what. fifty to seventy in the past month. Right, right. right. Uh, exactly. And, and but the these, things, is, these things can happen, right? Like Europe's most honest man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's yeah. It's definitely good. This is a good forum to put your agency under pressure, Matt. Like yeah, who's got equity in the brand? Oh, wow. Yeah, but that's that's an that was a, that's an angle issue as well. Just it is yeah. a content angle. We know why. It's just yeah. every few months shit just breaks and you have to start right. again. And it's an executional issue, next week, not consistently executing at yeah. speed. I think a lot of the that's what we just need to retain. Yeah, I do agree. Journey. When stuff's going well, well, evidently the people my my, my fault ultimately, like creatives, just come up taking the foot off the gas. That's what. I oh, mean, it's going right? well. We don't need more creatives. All right, it's flo- now it's fucking. And I think expired. that is the thing, right? Like, it, and and these things go in waves, and you mm. might like something might be going really badly, but yeah, it's just coming back to the point. Like, we might fuck up, so we've got to, we've got to have like a bit of a bit of an understanding of like if we're looking at a business and it's like at five percent, and it might be a strong business. Like, what's the risk that, yeah. of that? Because yeah. we, you know, it's not that we don't trust our team; it's that like they've got loads of other stuff to do, and suddenly the macro environment might change, and people just stop buying it. Like, yeah, <clears throat> we've definitely had problems with like consumer spending power like one of our consumables brands like um suddenly people like just people stopped uh, like started unsubscribing massively and that was basically because it was too expensive right is is that the one i know yeah really interesting yeah we've had i think we're benefiting from the opposite of that like massive yeah yeah, just like cheap product same experience right looking perfect which is a great angle right if you per, can, oh, can do it per, the, I think it's the closest to an irresistible offer you can get <laughs> yeah <laughs> same product it is it's cheaper fair. same product it's 10% of the price alright sound yeah. like all you yeah. have to do is convince them to try it once yep and you've got you've got your repeat but yeah there's a lot of the, it's impossible you just to need type. a fat legal insurance policy <laughs> oh, just, yeah it's just it's very a, very fat I think it's hard 100 to, million quid cover <laughs> I think it's hard to price in. It's impossible to price in risk from so many angles and so many like platform privacy changes. Yeah. Fucking, like, it's Everything. almost like how how much do you sweat it when it's like it's more like how do you spot? For me, if I was to buy a brand, it's that spotting leverage where yeah. you can apply time with high leverage and get big big upside on because you know you yeah. you know you're better than the person who's selling it. I think I think something. the thing is like when. I, I don't think I ever thought about this until quite recently, but if you think about an aggregator business, almost like a product business, i.e. if you're trying to get product market fit and you're trying to, you're having, your, your product is essentially cash, but you need to get good at deploying it, mm-hmm. right? Cash and time, really. Cash and time. You need yeah. to get good at deploying it. It'll take you a few tries to get good at deploying it. The problem is each try for us is like millions of pounds and that's mm. really, really expensive. Yeah. So you can't actually have that many tries. So of course you're going to, make mistakes you're not going to know you're going to look at a and and be like that is amazing and then turns out it's either wrong or you didn't realise that it was going to happen or like next day something gets stuck in the Suez Canal and you're stuck also do you like, think a lot of founders sell because they know they've, they've peaked because you hear <laughs> I mean you hear so many stories about wow. acquisitions and a year later it's fucking worth 10% of what it was well, they're, they're, and that, and or is like, that a sign they sold it too late I think that was just I think that's poor capital allocation on the 
on the person buying the business. And I also think we won't see as many of those ever again. I don't think we'll ever see a period of e-com where people who don't understand the business model are allocating high amounts of capital to businesses they don't know what the, like I think that's ma- a really mattress brands like mm. buying things I would have like loved that. to have launched my brand in 2016 yeah knowing oh, yeah. what I know now I think Shall everyone I'd have exited it. for 500 million yeah um, I don't I, I, from my perspective I don't know I think it may be uh, you, your question for you, obviously for you but I think there's a lot of people who probably think the Pete's in skill set perhaps yeah but, I think mo- motivation to sell like, is like yeah like you get the classics right you get the I don't want to run this business anymore but like the reason for that is is often like completely different depending but for example with the with the biggest one you mentioned like or another example yeah what typically have been the reasons even ones you haven't bought but when the founders have come to you mm. I imagine you've spoke to many more than five yeah of course what are the reasons typically um, and, and do certain reasons is that a red flag or I don't is there stuff <laughs> you prefer I think um, I I think generally the reasons either go from I've had enough like I've been doing this for a while and I'm either bored or I'm exhausted hmm. and I don't want to do this anymore and that is actually relatively common like people have life changes like the other thing is like linked to that but like people have life changes they might have a kid or they might uh, want to move abroad or they might I don't know even like their kid is growing up and they want to spend more time with them kind of thing like mm-hmm. and they've made quite a lot of money you know they've been take, they've been taking dividends out of their business for the last I don't know five years they're going to sell it for a decent packet like it, hmm. it, they're fine they finish the journey with it basically and they finish yeah. the journey with it and uh, so so that that's kind of probably the most common one the other thing we've had we've had like I've got two other businesses and I need to run them and I don't have time for this one that's that's also been relatively like people have quite a few people have done that so like people have like two or three brands or they have a services business and a and a brand and they've decided they want to do the services business instead or so the people have that i don't think there are any motivations from a founder that i would be like oh does, that doesn't really make sense i think the hope would be you can see that in the numbers somewhere and by the way when we do due, due diligence and we, you know the due diligence process is really important and the better we get it get a, get at it the better deals will do but we do go into all the accounts like audit yeah. all of them try and see what's going on like we got very close to a deal with another brand where and we pulled out of deals as well so we got really close to a deal where basically the a brand was kind of running out of cash and they wanted to sell we, we didn't necessarily realize they were running out of cash until a little bit later but we quite really quickly realized and we also saw we started to see that essentially what they were doing is they were um, sort of changing their product to make it cheaper because they were trying to preserve cash. So their, their product quality was going down, 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 down. And all of their trust buyer reviews, their trust buyer review, like it was like a really good average until it, like it started to just go down and suddenly everything was like two stars. And you're like, okay, this is a big red yeah, flag yeah. for us. Because if the product quality isn't there and you're essentially like... Um, Acquiring people are never going to return. Well, and, and, yeah, and, and like mm-hmm. you're kind of destroying your brand equity in the, to try and preserve your runway which is understandable like anyone would do that underst- understandably what the fuck is this space goods spacegoods.com rainbow dust version one my newest entrepreneurial econ brand venture i spent six months in the trenches building this shit from scratch we launched six weeks ago what's it all about the next generation wellness brand with a long-term vision to essentially consumerize the pending psychedelic consumer goods market, which might sound absolutely ridiculous. We're not quite there yet. The market's massively illegal. But what is this? Rainbow Dust version one is an all-in-one mushroom and adaptogenic blend designed to unlock your supernatural self. Essentially, experience a sharper focus, sustained energy, and zen-like calm throughout the day. It's an all-in-one powder. Tastes like fucking hot chocolate. Tastes delicious. Works great. Looks great. Feels amazing. Essentially, the broader concept here was to legally imitate a psychedelic microdose and, like I said, experience those symptoms. You can mix it with anything, brownies, bake brownies with it, mix it with your coffee, have it without coffee, replace your coffee, put it into a protein shake. It's super fucking versatile. It tastes great. It replaced the stack of supplements I was previously taking, but you need to try this shit. It would definitely change the way you work, get you into that deep workflow. I obviously think that myself, plenty of our thousand plus first customers think the exact same shit. It's not just a pretty packaging. It actually works really fucking well. Keto, vegan, all that good shit. Trust me, you need to try it for yourself. Let's scale the shit to the moon. Spacegoods.com. Get on your Rainbow Dust subscription and see how you fucking feel. Let's do it for the boys. Spacegoods.com.
we're talking about basically if there are motivations or things oh, that we yeah, see yeah. in businesses that yeah. make us worried. I don't think, as I said, I don't think there are any, I think everyone has the right to want to sell their business for whatever reason. And, yeah. and part of that is like, I want to make some money now and that's okay. And like a big reason why we're in the market and why our market exists is essentially like econ brands. There's this weird gap where you're at like, even like two, probably up to like 20 million where there aren't actually that many acquirers out there, right? And like when you get to scale, P come in, mm. like mm. conglomerates get like bigger, bigger people come in. And when you're subscale, there are kind of people, chances who like, you know, there are people who just want to buy brands and see what happens, right? Mm -hmm. But like the middle bit where you've got a got good scale, good traction, but you maybe for whatever reason don't want to do it anymore, or you've reached a point where you feel, sorry, you're at a plateau. And I think that's the other piece that people feel like a big part of the motivation, sorry, just coming back to that is that people feel like their brand has reached a point where either they have to commit a lot and hire a big team, get it to the US, get it to all these different countries and do all this headache stuff that they don't feel necessarily that they want to do or they're prepared to do. And they feel like they want someone to take it on and take it to the next step. And that's the really positive message. That's the kind of conversation you want to have with someone, which is like, hey, I've got this thing and I and, and those are the those are the founders we're really excited to work with because those are the founders who want to stay involved, who yeah. really want to help us out, especially with the product side, with really understanding the brand, because we're never going to understand someone's brand as well as that person does. And it would be insanely arrogant of us to think that we could. I think, you know, any anyone who puts their life blood into creating a product and then does goes through the immense stress of trying to scale that product to a point where it's profitable in, in the direct to consumer um, will know more about that market than a group of people who've raised some money and wanted to buy some brands. Mm, yeah. So so working with founders who are like really excited about working with us and want to partner with us and we're not the big bad money people, we're the people who can then help them by either, you know, using our networks to get that business into the US or like, you know, logistics networks or working with our specialists in TikTok or in Facebook or whatever, like, you know, all of those things where you might not have the specialism and you feel like, actually, I want to work with a partner. I want to work, work with someone. I can sell my business to someone who I think will really cherish it and take it on. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of conversation. That's the conversation where you're like, oh my God, I want this business. That's the exciting one. Have you ever looked at a loss making business and thought it was an opportunity to bring it in, <coughs> economies of scale, scale it up maybe, and you just thought the founder didn't have the operational expertise, et cetera, et cetera? Um, or are they just by default a no go? Particularly, I think now? I think financially it's more difficult, but we have looked at them. Um, we we will we will look at a lot of businesses. I think generally we try and avoid loss making businesses, okay. generally because we're buying businesses with debt, right? So we've got to pay the debt down somehow, and mm. we prefer that business to be able to wash its face. Um, and so, and I think especially now when businesses need to be a little bit more conservative with their cash and be a bit more smart, I think we, we would struggle to look at it. But I don't think I'd ever look at a business and think, oh, this founder's crap. Because mm -hmm. I think in order to go to that point where you'd have the scale for us to want to look at you at all, you've got to be doing, doing something right, right? Mm -hmm. And like, I definitely think we look at lots of businesses and say there's opportunities. But um, yeah, like people are good at loads of different things. And if you're really good at product, but you don't really understand your marketing, that doesn't make mean, it just means that marketing is an opportunity, um, but you're probably way better product than we would be. So, so like, how can we harness that in the right way? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. It's interesting. Yeah. 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 I guess that's a good, I think that's an interesting point. I don't think, I think in today's market, acquiring a loss making econ brands are very hard. I think also when the justify. headwinds are this strong, right? Yeah, like you really can't look at the market and be like, oh, well, you know, it's 2016 again and everyone's just going to buy loads of money. Like, yeah, unless you look into like the main acquisition channel and you're like, this is just shit and we could do way better. Yeah, maybe, I think yeah. The, only, the only problem is sometimes we've done that. With profitable businesses, we've looked at an acquisition channel and been like, <laughs> this account is horrendous. Like, why on earth is this happening? And we do it and we like restructure it and it just bombs. And yeah. you're like, how have we done that? But yeah. it's happened. And, you know, so so I kind of feel like, as I said, it's been in a really, the, the humbling part of it has been, has been, of that journey has been massive for me because it's kind of set, it kind of has taught me that even if you think there's a right way, there often is just not, there is just very, a lot, a lot of different ways and people do things and it works for them and that's okay. But the problem is getting to a point where you have to then scale that 
If you've got mm-hmm. five businesses that do that get wins in different ways, mm-hmm. that means you're operationally completely screwed, which comes back to that point of like, would we buy a brand, whatever, build a brand, sorry. Like what I would prefer to do is actually know what we're good at concentrate on what we're good at and say actually we know that this brand might be really good over here but we think we're so good at this other thing that we're going to concentrate on this other thing even though this brand might not like i think i think we have to be thinking more like that than trying to do horses for courses and try and Mm. adopt the the methods of every different business in every different way because we operationally that just can't work for us i don't think we just get really bloated we had too many staff we wouldn't get any of the economies of scale and then you're just a group of businesses and you've got no value add that gives you anything when you when you eventually if you if you ever want to exit or you know IPO or whatever whatever the end game is for your business or for our business like what that end game is you want to be showing that you're adding value in some way. Um, so. Makes a lot of sense. How does your day to day look? So it's pretty niche to um, be the founder of a big roll up with five co-founders yeah, yeah. buying pet brands and others. <laughs> pet brands nutrition brands got a couple of vegan nutrition brands yeah um day to day um well so we've got uh, we're really lucky we've got an office in london an office in barcelona um but we're a kind of hybrid team so some in the office some some not um but i'm generally i mean i i really like the office uh, as a space for me because i think i spent too much time in my flat during lockdown and i just was yes, like so. i, I like, and i'm too much of an extrovert like i like people too much i want to get out and be mm-hmm. be out and i can go to the gym and it's good so um a lot of my day-to-day is really about trying to understand that portfolio level question of what do we prioritize and what are the biggest opportunities across the portfolio and what are the areas that we really need to put resource into that will move the needle for us and my job essentially at, at now is i'm kind of managing the marketing commercial and creative side of the business so the growth part of the business and understanding a yeah what that prioritization is which brands we've got to prioritize what what kind of channels are we prioritizing and then also how do we make sure that those three parts of the business work really well together because i think sometime before our creative team kind of sat outside of the structure and was a services kind of a service team but that meant every team was sending them requests and that's like that was a nightmare for them and they didn't really have very much visibility over the commercial stuff what was going on who you know what was what was important so actually bringing them in to those meetings making sure they're really involved and they understand what's important and why so that you know x brand is more important than y brand or um i don't know this this kind of giveaway social post is actually less important than this paid ad whatever it might be is really important so a lot of my time is spent spent in that yeah that makes sense for creative understanding the feedback loop of what 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 makes a good ad is yeah like like most people running creative don't know that yeah and then the other part of my day really a lot lot other part of kind of where my brain is is often in the numbers so i spend a lot of time looking at and like reviewing p l's and marketing data and Mm. all the things you would spend a lot of your time looking at right what's profitable what's not why is it not profitable um and working with uh, one of my co-founders who runs the commercial side of the business to think about like pricing promotion where we are all of that so so i think that's a big part of what what i do where do you see the mothership landing in a few years oh yeah yeah you got to get in the puns um I think... And is there a timeline or an end game at all? So I think... I, I want to... Um, let me answer this. Uh, I want to think about it. Put um, PR hat on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no I'm it's not... Media trained. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I really, I really should get better, better at podcasts. Yeah. I talk too much, I think. Um, I, I think the mothership is on a probably a longer journey than we thought it would be basically i think i think again coming back to that classic founder naivety of like this is gonna be amazing in five years time we're all gonna be on the beach wow (laughs) um i think this has gone from a from this is becoming a long a longer term business right and i think that's for two reasons i think firstly the market so i think scale scale sustainable scale scale of d2c brands and businesses is way harder even than two years ago Mm -hmm. and i think we want to be smart 
right? We don't want to get there fast because we, we don't want to believe that we can get there 10 times faster um, because someone's giving us a big check. I don't think we do believe that. I think we want to get there as fast as we can based on the skill sets that we're going to build, but we want to be really strong at what we do because I think that will make a more sustainable business. And I think what we're focused on is creating a sustainable business for us. Um, so yes, then there is there are plenty of end goals that are possibilities and the benefit of having a business that's profitable and hopefully of scale is um, that we will have, hopefully, there will always be options to exit at some point. If you can get to that, for us, probably to that 30, 50, 50 million pound range of, of, of revenue, I think there's always good options to exit um, if, you're, if you've got strong economics. So I think that's really the focus for us. And at that point, yeah, okay, could IPO, could get, could, could do a buyout, could actually keep the business and take dividends depending on where, where we are. But, but I think that that's really the focus. I don't think we're like IPO in five years time. That's what we care about. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that actually has been more of a journey for us of discovery over the last couple of years about what we're good at or rather what we're, what we're not good at, what we need to get better at, um, and also kind of what we want as a group. Because obviously the, the kind of elephant in the room is that there's six people at the top of the company, all of which will have different desires and thoughts and questions and um, and aims from the business. And so a big part, and I do not envy our CEO's job, a big part of that is kind of, kind of balancing, balancing yeah. all of those priorities and being really clear about how to communicate what we want and how and I, I have massive respect for, for, for the amount of um, difficult conversations that he's had to have both with us and also all the way through the business right about what does this look like but I think we're massively concentrating really on creating value for us um, and creating value for the brands that we buy and so I don't think if you put a five year time stamp on that I think I think you'll just try and do too much too quickly and then you'll you'll end up maybe ruining those decisions a bit more than if you'd taken it a little bit slower but been really smart about where you put your resources. Yeah. Everything takes longer than you think, right? Yeah. I well, think, I, I, I think, think that's I think, tired by I it. think in when you're in e com that's like almost I think there's a lot of people most of the people watching this podcast, include me included, you're TikTok dropshippers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and more more than more than the, until Last year, they'd never lived in an, e never really experienced an economic downturn that they could mm. remember, and they lived through a fi like oh, a fifteen yeah. year, no, like fifteen 12, yeah, 13. ten to fifteen year boom. Yeah. So it's easy to think that that never changes yeah. when it's like oh, when you actually think changed, about yeah. it, mm. it's like a just macroeconomic cycle, isn't it? Like it happens for various reasons. Um, yeah, someone, someone, uh, someone said to me the other day, if you're if you're still playing the game, you've got a chance of winning. And that, yeah. and that kind of resonated with me a lot like if you can keep going like and I think you're right everything takes longer than it than you think like my first when I left my my kind of proper job and went into my first startup like the founder obviously sold me the dream you know like yeah. we're gonna we're gonna raise all this money it's gonna be incredible and then like even getting an ad done took three weeks you know like these things just take longer and then suddenly it's like quite down by the way so I want to put it in the fucking <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's just a playing the game you got a chance I like that it's good isn't it it kind of sticks street. yeah it, it sticks with you you know like and, mm -hmm. I, and I think that everything just takes longer like um, and and that's okay um, but you've got to be aware of that um, you and want. make decisions because of, like to, to yeah. maximise the long term value as well it's very 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 easy and I think especially in a world where literally you're looking at data on a day to day or hourly basis it's so easy to get drawn into the what do we have to do now like this month this this day and sometimes that's a really good energy to have but you've got to balance it with understanding what your long term vision is yeah um, especially in e-commerce I think I think it's super hard right like there's, there's really definitely cool. like just want to chat scale some landing pages <laughs> really like, yeah. think it's about just like, and value and shit yeah and I think also when when you're trying to balance that with cash and someone's mm. like, oh, well, what would be really lovely if is if we did this like cool collaboration with thing? And you're like, well, why need to make revenue now? I think that's, that's prioritization really though. That's prioritization. Let's do direct mail campaign. Let's do Instagram. That's just prioritization and like yeah. awareness of where you are as a journey. Like there's yeah. brands, there's some brands that shouldn't go and spend 100K a month on YouTube right now. They should spend it all on Facebook. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, actually something about Tell you something about Ollie that um, has always stuck in my mind is Ollie is probably one of the only agency 
people I've ever worked with. We worked together very briefly and very sadly, very briefly, but that was more our, us than, so than him. Ran one of their brands and fucked it. Uh, no, 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 content for um, them. Uh, but he, we were spending on some TikTok and we just were not ready for TikTok at all. And we had no idea what we were doing. We had a terrible website with no landing pages. And it was just a bit of a, you know, punt and see what happens. And Ollie was just like, he, we had a call and he was like, I'm not spending anymore. There's no point in you spending anymore. Just don't spend. And I was like, actually fair play for that. Like, you know, you know, like there are a lot of people who'd be like, I think you should spend 10 grand, you know, like I think you should whack up the budget. And at the very least he was like, just don't do it. And I think that, that was good. I think that was a, that, that, that to me told of someone who had seen a few things. Man of the people. Well, yeah. There's also brands where we do this. There's also brands where we don't get that right. Yeah, really? Two is the world's <laughs> Folded himself into the boat. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, he became one with it. Um, yeah. There's also brands where we haven't got that right, but yeah. It's like, we just launched on TikTok again. Yeah, how's it going? We spent 100, spent 100 quid. Yeah, it got a 50 quid purchase on the first yeah, day. Yeah, it's starting okay. That's our target. It's just time. like awareness of what I it is. I do does. think it'll help. It will. I'd like to get it to at least a thousand a day spend, just ASAP. It's just just ASAP on that platform that like, just like the, 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 the problem the other problem with TikTok not to dive into like too much like nitty gritty platform shit because <laughs> a lot of people won't care is like the reason we always I always say do meta first is because to do TikTok at two to three K a day requires so much infrastructure. Yeah. So much content output. Yeah. Meta requires three good single images and you can just spend five yeah. K yeah. consistently for months. Yeah. And it's so in like producing 25 to 30 videos a month to do th- to spend 2k a day not many businesses have not many bi- businesses are in a position where that's the best use of that money yeah and that money could just go and be spent somewhere else with higher and i've just like sold loads of people off my own business there but like it's mm. just like and that's what i think that's what, why he's a man of the people he doesn't that, want he doesn't want the money but that's what i think about those like brand managers is like, like what you were saying like that's why that's the hard you, there's very few people who have the the, the cross section of like when wh- where's the right time it's hard to, it's really hard to do I don't obviously I'm not the I'm not great at it for every brand but knowing exactly where to spend the, the next ten grand I think that if, you could, really if you can just spending more on Instagram even beyond that though <laughs> like, it feels well, like that is really sticking even, with you even isn't beyond it? that it's like do I bring on another person do I yeah. like is that the right. wisest next decision like. Or you just Chad scale and fucking be Where, autistic but, in your bedroom. Yeah, like, basically what, just, they're my roots. So I'm trying to build a legitimate business this time around rather than just some fucking freelance, yeah. ridiculous scale. <laughs> mm. It's always that they also, they also wonder whether like, and there'll be people smarter than me in this space who could do this, but like, I wonder if there's a point at which, and there will be, again, I just don't know how to calculate it, but there'll, there'll be a point for every brand at which spending more money on advertising and trying to grow becomes like a net inefficient. And I wonder what point yeah, that is. is. Yeah, there will be. Like there'll be, for a, even for a gym shark, there'll be a point at which trying to get, they, it depends who you're answering to, obviously, and it's you have to be in the luxury position of almost being bootstrapped and yeah. to never have to chase more growth. But, Every brand will have a like a sweet spot. Depends what the outcome is, though, isn't it? Because like you said about acquisitions getting interesting past like twenty million. Some people said ten million in revenue. Yeah, ten million. Right. But, like yeah. eight figures basically is when yeah you potentially get a revenue multiple from the right buyer and like strategics come into the market rather than just selling to a chance that, like you said or like a small boutique. Well, not the mother. Oh, hey. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. No, I think, I think, if you I think you're P&G right. If you to buy, you probably need to be doing 50 million in revenue. Yeah, yeah. Or more. But, was- but then the, that is the question, right? Coming back to your point, right? The, 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 I think the incentives are set up really weirdly in the sense that actually the real dream is to be bootstrapped to that point and basically be in total be control just and like you don't destiny, you know, exactly destiny. To- choose your own de- destiny and see what you want but actually the vast majority of people aren't really in that and they yeah. and they say like the only thing we have to do is exit so you then see people going okay what do we do now and they i don't know they go into brick and mortar or they do stuff which is like massively cash intensive that might be great but it's a massive risk awesome. and actually could could hurt their business long term which maybe is the wrong thing to do or they just start just spending even more and more and more. Massively but the- stressful as well. Yeah. Massively stressful. Oh. Depends what you want out of life, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, do you want think to build it's... a bedroom brand and make a few million quid or do you want to it's interesting. be on the rich list and build a monster? <laughs> what do you want, Matt? 
Definitely. The latter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to build a monster. Build a monster. Yeah. Yeah. Enough build a bedroom brand. May as well try and swing big this time. Yeah, why not? But I'll probably land somewhere in between in reality. And it'll probably take 20 years. Mm. I think it, yeah. At least 10. That universal truth of it always takes longer than you think. It's yeah. just so, like, I don't think I realise, like, you guys are younger than me, but like, I felt pretty young when I started this this thing and I I never knew really what I wanted. I've never known what I wanted to do at all. You know, like, as I said, was going to be a singer for a while. I still am a singer, actually, but um, not full time. Yeah, choral choir singer, singer. Like, choir singer, yeah. Is that the right mm. term, chorister? Uh, not really. Well, I don't know. You call me what you want. I don't mind. <laughs> Cor- chorister generally. You uh, when I when you say chorister, I generally think of like little kids. Yeah, right. Um, well, I'm I'm clearly not yeah. that. So, but I I'm just a singer. I'm a choral singer. Yeah. Nice. Um, but I was going to do that full time. I was going to do the art world thing. Uh, I don't know where my life's going to take me. But yeah. I definitely didn't realise. I, I I kind of probably said it to people at the time oh this might be a five to ten year maybe longer thing but I definitely didn't realise realise in my like self um, what I was actually signing up for in terms of like how long how, how fucking hard it is how long term it is yeah. what a commitment it is and, and kind of and, and also like yeah. also like the a lot a lot of where it is difficult is not where you think it's going to be difficult you kind of expect the you know you're going to work quite hard and you're going to be a bit stressed about stuff but you didn't don't necessarily realize the like the people part of stuff and like making sure that everyone's kind of like aligned and how you have a really difficult conversation with someone like i think i've got so much better at like having difficult conversations yeah. and like i have definitely like, being well. being up front with people it. being up front about what mm-hmm. i want I'm still not great at talking about myself, but I'm getting better at that. You know, like uh, those kind of like public speaking, like all of those things you learn a bit more that you didn't think you were going to learn much about, but you, you do. Yeah. Yeah, I've basically been stressed since 2016. Yeah, I've I think I've stressed since 2016. Definitely. Like, just, like, just, yeah, I think it's the game. Yeah. To man- you manage and higher stress tolerance. Um, it's difficult. And yeah. I, I taking, I, I mean, like the whole, you know, I, I think everyone struggles in their own way with, 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 the pressures it puts on you and if you've got personal stuff going on or whatever like I think I definitely am very bad at noticing when I've gone over that edge of like you're stressed and now you're like in the kind of burnout stage and I'm really grateful for people around me to be like you really need a break like and actually taking that break I I, as I was saying I I just got I just got back from my first ever two week holiday in my entire career and it was great. I, I did would my recommend first yeah. holiday with no laptop last year, and it was just like I still haven't done one. You have to do it. Like, <coughs> the fuck, oh, Jesus! You have you have to oh. do it. Like, um, <coughs> sure, it sure. disagrees. <laughs> I think it's like it really really important. I think yeah. when you go, it's the temptation is to go on holiday, take your laptop, and work whilst you're there. I've actually only yeah. done that. And like, it's just like s- so 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 limiting on like re- it doesn't you don't reset. Yeah. You don't get new creativity. Yeah. It's you might as well just not go. Like you might you literally might as well just not go. I, I agree. And like even even the small things, like even if you're like, I'm gonna leave my laptop, I'm gonna take my phone, or like I'm gonna have like Slack on my phone or emails on my phone. Like I was literally like I'm gonna switch off from pretty pretty much everything. Yeah, log right? out of everything. Yeah. And tell give someone your WhatsApp number and be like the only if, yeah, breaks, if you if, if it you, breaks, if, call me. Like if you need me, yeah. Call me, otherwise I'm not gonna answer yeah. you, basically. Yeah, massive, massively important for me. And you'll come back like, and your output will be 10x what it was before mm. you left as well for the next like, yeah. six months. And things that seemed really big won't seem as big. They'll seem much more like those mountains you have to climb will see a lot more. You'll be able to see like the first step a lot easier because yeah. sometimes when you're so tired and you're like worried about everything, you're looking at this thing being like, how on earth am I going to get there? It feels impossible. We're never going to get there. And then you just feel like it's that one step. It feels easier to take. I think that's yeah, that's what I get. Like when I'm when I'm close to burnout, I'm like I know what I need to do, but I just can't can't like bring myself to yeah, actually start absolutely. doing it. So I'll be like, oh, I, need, I know I need to write like X Y Z piece of content. And I'm like, God, I just couldn't do anything worse than doing that. Right yeah, now. yeah, you just like you just I'm, and I'll just scroll and I'll just start like scrolling around my computer. I just start scrolling around my computer and just like doing stuff that literally makes no like, very minimal impacts. I'm like, right, yeah. I should probably just not be sat here yeah, right now. Yeah, Twitter becomes your best friend at yeah, that point. I should like, just I've spent f- an hour on Twitter reading yeah, about D2C. You said about walks. Yeah, walks is probably, well, I think walks is big. I think getting out in nature is big. I think walk, walks is really good. I think that's when the most good, I, I never, my best ideas don't happen when I'm working. 
Yeah. I, th- I think some, a lot of the good ones do, but the best ones are the points that where I start like a better, like a completely creative idea. I think mm. more like logical, data-driven ideas come, yeah, when you start there, but like anything yeah. that's like creative. I definitely think- Innovative. Taking time to think is like a real piece of work. Like as in, it's, it should be part of your mm. rhythm of like, sit and stare at a wall or go go for a walk or do something where you're like that's the bit where or like I'll go for a run or something like exercise yeah. is really important for, like exercise is really important for me to just like get out of my head but also sometimes just like think about stuff is like yeah really important it's what like Bezos Warren Buffett it's like they make one good decision a month and it's massive leverage mm. spend more on Instagram <laughs> spend more on Instagram <laughs> don't do that zero, zero <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah find a few questions Go for What's it. been the hardest thing in everything building this, building the ship? Uh, I'd say that uh, this has been the single greatest test of my own self confidence I've ever had. Like, Imposter syndrome vibe. I, I have. I'm like. I, I've. I've always been like relatively. Yeah. Like I had an anxious personality. I've always like um, diff- had challenges with like I guess. I'm a classic insecure overachiever, right? Like mm. I've like educated a, you know, ridiculous institution that, you know, you, you like always feel like you want to do more and like in competition needing to be the best and all this stuff, right? Like I, I think that staring into the abyss of like, oh God, it's like, this is a thing that my name's on and that I need to do and I don't know how to do any of these things. And like all of these amazing people are on Twitter talking about how amazing it is and how incredible they are and like all the, you know like it's like it's not you know it's just full of lies you know it, but exactly same, but like i think for me the same kind of insecurity absolutely as well, like, but i think for me like even even just small things like getting up I, it sounds really weird like my my co-founders and i were like a group of us were at our christmas party or actually even more recently at our our like we had a meet a whole company meet up in edinburgh right like 40 something people in a room in edinburgh and you're like a oh, you know, this is terrifying. I'm supposed to be authoritative. And I just, mm. just, I'm just like, I, I, I think I regress. I behave like a child because I'm like so scared of like stepping into what that might mean for me as like a founder of a business and someone to be impressed by in some way. Yeah. Um, and it gets to a point where if someone asks you like, you know, what are you proud of in your life? You're like, I literally can't think of anything. I have no idea. You know, and I think that that's been for me. That's been the biggest test and the hardest thing. It's like just managing myself and my understanding of myself during the process. Um, yeah. Nice. My final question is very cliche, but I ask it to everyone now. If you could give three bits of advice to your eighteen-year-old self upon reflection, what would they be? Oh. You should get some gems, or you get some cliches regurgitated, but either well, will do. A mix of the two is great. Oh, yeah. Look, I think my I think I was a bit of a dickhead when I was 18 um oh. yeah um I'd say um relax like I think I was very uptight <laughs> and um that's a really good one we've not had yeah I think I think there's something about like it, it will take some time and that's okay and you know you, you'll muddle through um I'd say listen like learn how to really listen to people and sit in that moment where someone's telling you something that you want to like be like no I'm fucking absolutely not like you feel really defensive or you're angry and learning how to listen and to sit and and to like accept that someone else is saying something and you can really hear it before really feeling like you want to hear the sound of your own voice and jump in um that's really important um Third one. Start an econ brand. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do direct mail. Start Don't early. do direct mail is yeah. the third one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think the, I think the third one is is um, this maybe is, sounds cliche, but like um, something like remember to have fun or like keep it light. Sometimes you know, remember light is okay. You know, you, I think sometimes you can take something really really seriously. And I definitely am someone who like really commits and takes something really, really seriously and gets really deep into the thing where I'm like, everything is so important. And then actually you yeah. spend your time, like all your mates are like, you're only talking about this thing or you're only talking about how stressed you are or whatever. And we used to just like chat shit and talk about 
being choristers or like you know like uh like or football or you know cricket whatever like you know you talk about all this like it's okay Mm. to also just just have a beer with some mates and not be in it all the time um at least money to a way of working ever yeah yeah yeah. i mean i mean like maybe that makes me a bad entrepreneur you know like i think i think maybe that doesn't you know maybe uh, I'm not going to build a great personal brand off that, but like I will. Yeah, it probably works. Be a real one. <laughs> but I, I do, I do think yeah. it's just really important. Like actually laughing, having fun, and realizing that at the end of the day, what we do is we sell shit online, and that's okay. And like sometimes you can be like, I don't think that matters that much comparatively to what is in front of me right now. That's mm. okay. Mm. Um, so those are my three. Beautiful. Anything to add? No. So it was profound. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's refreshing to have that perspective I think sometimes because money to it is poisonous price I Just think so about 4% of them do anything seriously successful <laughs> one term value cap. so um, it's been a pleasure thanks so much for having me yeah. three hours thank you very much coming on. On. subscribe no, to the pod as always yeah we'll be back soon and if you want to sell your business go check out the money yeah do it there. thanks <laughs>